This is episode number 179 of the Mixology Talk podcast, and we're going to finish off our focus with tiki, and what better way to do that than talk about modern tiki. So we have a great guest in store for you, Daniel Doth Parks of Zombie Village in San Francisco, and he's going to talk to us what it means to be kind of the more modern style of tiki drink, so stay tuned. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. So we're kind of wrapping up Tiki Month and we have an amazing guest for our next interview here. Uh, Daniel Doc Parks uh, is joining us to talk about modern Tiki. So welcome to the uh, the podcast. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in um, kind of Tiki. Uh, we had an amazing interview uh, and it gained a whole new knowledge of Tiki for me uh, with Beach Bum Baryon and just the way he told the story about why there's so many different rums out there and kind of how it plays into the whole history of cocktails. Uh, it really got me excited about it. And I realized that recently there's been this big kind of movement uh, towards a more modern style uh, Tiki. And um, that I'm just really, really happy and excited to talk to you about this, man. So, um, yeah, definitely appreciate your time. Awesome. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Doc Parks from San Francisco. I'm the general manager over at Zombie Village, um, which is uh, part of the Future Bars group. I've been working with them for uh, a little over five years, six years now. Uh, some of their better known uh, bars that people might be familiar with were, would be Rick House or Bourbon and Branch, uh, local edition. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, four years ago, um, we opened up Pagan Idol. Um, which was a project uh, they brought me on for. Uh, and, uh, you know, tiki bars have seen quite a resurgence over the past, you know, even, you know, six to 10 years, I would say. It's been a, uh, a minute since you, you've seen these bars starting to pop up. But in the past five years, you've seen a whole lot of them uh, as, you know, tiki bars really having a, a moment. Um, pre-COVID, of course. <laughs> right. But, uh, but yeah, Zombie Village, we opened up uh, in uh, January of 2019. Uh, we just celebrated our, our year anniversary at the beginning of this year before the, the COVID shut down. But um, uh, it's, been, it's been an incredible ride. And, uh, you know, the, the escapism behind Tiki Bars is uh, something that, you know, I feel like is a, uh, a real need uh, in today's world uh, as far as what people are looking for, you know, when they are going out for a cocktail. So, yeah, I agree with you. Like uh, when Julie and I were thinking about what kind of um, focus to have, um, we just felt like, you know, things were lined up, you know, this thing is very heavy. The COVID is very heavy on everybody. And Tiki just makes sense for, for this kind of time right now. Like, you know, when you go to a Tiki bar for me anyways, it's, a lot more happy memories. It's, you know, thoughts of vacation. You kind of isolate yourself from the world in this cool little tropical paradise. Um, so, you know, the little things that we could do to kind of bring people back to that moment, I think, uh, are, are really important right now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, what, um, obviously you didn't start uh, Tiki by with this project, but what got you into tropical drinks or Tiki um, in the beginning? Um, well, my ties to Tiki are uh, pretty deeply rooted uh, and a bit generational. Uh, my grandparents um, were very close friends with uh, Bill and Bonnie Seeley. Uh, and Bonnie, um, formerly uh, Bonnie Bergeron, is the daughter of Trader Vic. Oh, wow. So my mother grew up, um, you know, with Peter Seeley kind of as, you know, her her removed sibling, if you will. So they, they were very close growing up and, um, Peter later became the CEO of the Trader Vic's corporation. Uh, he, you know, often, uh, visited, uh, our family gatherings, you know, as, as the years went on. So for me, uh, I was introduced to, you know, Trader Vic's and, and, uh, the legacy of Vic Bergeron early in life. So, um, I do remember reading, uh, Trader Vic's uh, 1946 cocktail book well before I was 21. So I was already in that kind of, you know, uh, 
mindset of, of, you know, understanding how he was building his cocktails and, and his, his, you know, stories and everything that went along with the brand that he built in his lifetime, um, which, you know, ended up being quite valuable when I did get into professional bartending later in life. Um, you know, I already kind of had, I mean, that the tropical cocktails that I learned of through his books were some of the first drinks I knew of period. So it definitely, um, helped me out, so to speak. Sure. So you're basically kind of steeped in, in, in tropical drinks from birth, basically. <laughs> Yeah, tropical drinks. And I mean, really, I, I remember my, my grandmother was an amazing host, is an amazing host. And uh, she turns 90 this year. So, uh, and, you know, I, I remember watching the way she would host family gatherings and even her own, you know, friend groups and things like that. And uh, knowing that, that I wanted to be in hospitality, you know, I really had an appreciation for the way she... Um, you know, extended herself through hospitality, you know, in her home. Uh -huh. And it, it is definitely a piece of, of why I found myself, you know, moving towards hospitality in my professional life. Sure. Absolutely. Um, now, are there any kind of cocktails, um, tiki or tropical drinks um, that really caught your attention that you just kind of gravitated uh, towards? Um, you know, I remember, tasting my first Navy grog. Mm -hmm. And that to this day is still one of my favorite cocktails of all time. Um, you know, th that would, that would be one for sure. Of course, a Mai Tai is always, you, you know, um, always appropriate. Sure. But, um, but it would, if, if I had to pick one, it would definitely be the Navy grog that, that caught my attention and made me go, okay, there's, there's something here, you know, that, that, that you don't see everywhere else. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, do you have a uh, recipe that you like with the Navy grog? Oh yeah, or, definitely. Or for, that, for that matter. Um, yeah. Uh, with the Navy grog, I mean, uh, on the zombie village menu, we, uh, we featured, uh, what we call the docks grog and, uh, you know, it's a blend of, of three different rums, very, very strong, very potent, of course, fresh grapefruit and lime juice. And then, uh, what I call Doc's spice syrup number one, which is, uh, you know, an ingredient that I, I d developed, uh, well before we opened, uh, Pagan Idol, but it ended up proving to be, uh, essential for, for what we did with both bar programs at Pagan Idol and Zombie Village. Sure. Okay. Uh, so it's a little, it's a little bit of, of a, a, a riff, if you will, on, on the traditional Navy grog, but, um, the, the spice element is, is crucial. And I tend to like my drinks on the less sweet side. So um, definitely, you know, flexing the, the ratios a little bit from sure, uh, the traditional recipes, of course. Yeah. Um, so what got you into, like, when we talk about modern tiki, I mean, my, my version of modern tiki might be different from other people. So I just kind of want to um, explain my thought and maybe you can give your input. Um, because it's much more about than mine, obviously. Um, so for me, modern modern tiki is more along the lines of like taking a lot of those traditional um, tiki ingredients that we use. Like it's a very obviously very rum based um, style of drinks, and then substituting it into maybe more whiskey focus or gins or other ingredients outside of the rum category. Is that a, a, a decent definition, or am I missing something pretty critical here? Um, I mean, I think modern tiki can take a lot of forms, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I think switching to spirit base is definitely a good way to expand on, you know, some of the the formulas that that we study um, with with classic tiki drinks or classic tropical cocktails. Um, so yeah, spirit base is definitely a big one in terms of kind of advancing it forward into some some new things, new cocktails, um, and then you have. Uh, things like Amaro's and, and Sherry's uh, that you see kind of making their way into the, into the ingredient list of some of these uh, newer bars that are, that are out there doing tropical cocktails. So um, of course there's modern techniques as well. Um, so things like milk punches, I feel are, are, you know, fitting into uh 
a tropical or, or uh, exotic cocktail format as well. Uh, one, one cocktail that we um, sell an awful lot of at Zombie Village, we call it the JBMP, but it's essentially a Jungle Bird milk punch. Oh, so wow. now that cocktail, it was kind of, honestly, it, it, it blew my mind when we tried it out because I just took our, our house recipe for a Jungle Bird and applied it to a milk punch format and clarified it. Uh-huh. And it's, you know, one of my favorite cocktails I've ever come up with. It's, it's, uh, it's got the, the perfect balance of those tropical, um, flavors as well as the, the bitterness on the finish with the Campari. Um, so yeah, those modern techniques, you know, certainly are, um, kind of elevating and evolving what, um, we know as tropical and exotic cocktails, no doubt. Excellent. So it sounds like, um, you're pulling in a lot, just basically opening up the category of, of, tropical drinks and just pulling everything into it that you possibly can and, and finding, finding a good place for it to live. Um, same thing that we all do with like food or restaurants or, you know, um, prohibition or pre-prohibition cocktails. It sounds like you're doing, applying the same kind of, uh, ingenuity, uh, into more just of a tropical setting then. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about getting creative with it. So any, any inspiration you can find, um, you know, be it from, uh, if you're trying to, you know, find inspiration from different parts of the world, which is a great way to go, or just, you know, f- from whatever's fresh at your farmer's market, um, you know, you can really find fun and interesting ways to, um, you know, riff on some of these, some of these cocktails. Awesome. And so like with the, a lot of the pre-prohibition style drinks that we're all very familiar with, um, they kind of say that there's, depending on who you ask, there's anywhere from two to six to 12 different cocktail families in, out there. And then once you understand the structure, it's easy to kind of manipulate um, the ingredients and come up with something unique. Um, are there cert- like similarities in, in tropical drinks, Tiki, where you guys have kind of structured cocktail families um, that you can kind of do the same thing with? Sure. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, the, the, you see the, the cocktail families, uh, in tropical drinks, just like you do with, um, prohibition era and and earlier, but your daiquiris, your punches, your sours, old fashions. I mean, those all come into play, um, you know, in, in tropical cocktails, just as much as they do, um, with any other, you know, any other style. Um, uh, when we opened up Pagan Idol, we had a, one of our most popular cocktails was the pineapple express. And that was a egg white sour um, that we made with a nice rum blend. We used the Stiggins plantation pineapple split base with some uh, Demerara uh, 86. Uh, We were using Skipper at the time, but the Hamilton 86 is very similar and, you know, a little bit of passion fruit syrup for the, for the sweet egg whites. And then our vanilla Angostura bitters on top. And, um, you know, incredible how just switching it to a rum sour finding finding your rum blend and and using a tropical syrup can totally take what we all know as a classic sour to a new level and in in that tropical direction for sure yeah absolutely so what's funny is i think i actually went to pagan idol before we left san francisco and i've actually had that cocktail and it blew my mind it was so good (laughs) nice (laughs) with a a name like pineapple express you can't not have it (laughs) It's worth a try, so it better be good. Right, exactly, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully, I hope the bartender nailed the uh, pineapple stencil on top, though. So. I don't remember, but I, I'm sure they uh. did because it was it was busy, man. I think this was like opening week, and you guys were you guys were killing it. You guys were doing such a great job. Um, so yeah, I, I remember I remember that cocktail. I remember it really well. Awesome. That was a wild opening, man. I mean, you know, uh, the idea of a high volume bar is, is one thing and, and, you know, a stretch in its own right, but a high volume tiki bar is a whole nother animal, man. Well, I mean, <laughs> really you guys are doing like multi-touches. I mean, tiki by itself, by its nature is a very multi-touch kind of build, right? Cause it's oh, yeah. not just, it's not just like three bottles and you're done uh, unless you kind of start blending, which I'm sure you guys have streamlined, but um, it, it's many, many steps. Definitely. Yeah. And you know, we do take advantage of, of batching some of the spirits together, especially with split based cocktails. Um, 
but it's a lot of touches. You're absolutely right. And, and, you know, that's, w- that's where actually getting back to your uh, question about, you know, cocktail families, that's when you're memorizing these recipes, um, that's where it, it really comes into play. You know, when you, when you are building, you know, five or more cocktails at once, um, you know, and they all have five plus touches, you know, ha- uh, grouping them in, in families. It was one way to help keep your mind straight on like what, which cocktails, which, and, you know, build effectively and uh, efficiently. That's smart. That's really smart. Cause you're probably using similar ingredients in, um, you know, within that structure and within that, those ingredients, uh, the cocktails there. So, Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Now, are there any kind of like new cocktail families that are kind of almost specific to Tiki? Hmm. Um, you know, I, it's funny you asked that question because, uh, there's a cocktail I have called the vacation. It's published in Matt Petrick's, uh, minimalist Tiki book. And that formula, um, is one that's really fun to riff off of. And mm-hmm. essentially it's, uh, it's two plus ounces of spirit. Um, uh, it's published as three ounces of spirit. Um, it's a blend of, uh, rums and Pisco, mm-hmm. uh, an ounce of pineapple, three quarter lime, half ounce mango syrup, quarter ounce falernum, and a dash of vanilla angostura bitters. Now you can take that same build and start to kind of like play with either your spirit base or maybe switch in your lime to lemon, depending on what other flavors you're using. If you want to swap out your mango for a different syrup and that, that formula is, is something that, um, we di- we riff on on our own menu at Zombie uh-huh. Village. So so you know, officially, no, I'm not calling that a a new cocktail family. But that structure um, I've found is quite useful when you're trying to like you know riff or do a dealer's choice for a for a regular guest who just wants to try something different off menu or something like that. Perfect. So let me walk you through this real quick. Make sure I have it. Two plus ounces of spirit. Uh, you said there was one ounce of pineapple juice, pineapple juice. Okay. And three quarter ounce of lime, half an ounce of mango syrup, uh, quarter ounce of falernum and one dash of vanilla Ango. That's correct. Oh, wow. Okay. I know yeah, what I'm going to have to try this weekend now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Give that a try for your weekend <laughs> imbibing. No, I mean, it sounds super refreshing already. Just looking at the ingredients, it sounds delicious. Um, very cool. Now, one of the other things that um, I kind of struggle with with Tiki, because I'm, I'm a complete novice, I will be 100% honest on this, is um, there seems to be a lot of kind of tools that you use specifically for Tiki, or maybe not tools necessarily, but the focus on glassware is a huge component, and presentation is a huge component um, to this style of drink. Uh, are there any tools that really do help out a lot when you're making this kind of tending a bar uh, with Tiki drinks? Yeah, if you're trying to, you know, elevate your your tiki cocktails or your tropical cocktails, um, the Hamilton Beach Spindle Blender is is in my opinion essential. That's that's the one piece of equipment that's not at every bar, but I think should be. Um, when you're talking about um, tiki drinks, you're usually dealing with a lot of crushed ice, and some of these recipes um, benefit from that spindle blend. Um, and, you know, it's also important to understand which cocktails might not, you know, for instance, uh, classic Mai Tai, I prefer to shake with crushed ice rather than um, spin in a Hamilton Beach, uh, simply because you can over aerate it so easily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you really want to get those ingredients all all diluted and cold together, but it's easy to over aerate it. Now, when you have some of your other tropical cocktails that might have like like pineapple juice or even like orange or grapefruit, um, the, uh, you know, the, the froth that you get and the, the texture that you get from a Hamilton beach is really hard to, to replicate with shaking. So, um, that would be one piece of equipment that I think is crucial for, for a tiki bar. Um, of course, a, a regular blender is, is also important if you want to make a, a proper, you know, pina colada or a Miami vice for somebody. Um, I recommend the Vitamix. Uh, they used to call it the bar boss, um, which is kind of like, 
it's a step down, but it's pretty much the same motor mm-hmm. as, as the regular Vitamix that you would see in a, you know, commercial kitchen or something like that. But, um, the, the Vitamix definitely produces, um, fantastic texture for your blended cocktails. And then, you know, the, the absolute most important thing as always with any type of cocktail, uh, is ice. So, um, having good crushed ice is going to make your cocktails go from, you know, okay to good or from good to great. Um, and for me, um, what I've found is the Scotsman crushed ice machine is the ultimate. And, uh, I found this out when we opened up Pagan Idol because that's the machine that our company just happened to own Mm -hmm. from who knows how long ago. And it was down there in our commissary kitchen. And, you know, I went and that's what we started working all of our Pagan Idol drinks with and uh, came to find out that that is premium, the Scotsman. Now, uh, over at Zombie Village, we use a Hoshizaki crushed ice machine, which is also fantastic. Um, but there's something about the way the Scotsman produces the, the, the flakes of crushed ice yeah. that, um, it's, it's ideal. And, you know, the, when you have a, what I would call a perfect, like my type, for instance, you know, you can enjoy the cocktail through a straw and usually if it's well balanced, you're going to kill that drink before your ice melts. And you're going to be left with like about a half a glass of clean like fresh crushed ice basically, you know, and you'll have sucked out all of the flavor, you know, there'll, there'll be of course some residual flavor if you actually ate the ice or something like that. But, um, but it holds, it, it holds its uh, integrity that the, the crushed ice does with that Scotsman. So. Yeah. What's crazy is um, the Mai Tai is a great example of how important ice is and the type of ice, in my opinion, uh-huh. um, because I remember making Mai Tai's, with just average ice, like big block ice, um, you know, um, can't think of the name of it, but the normal like one inch cubes. Sure. Yeah. Cold, cold draft, draft maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I, then I was like, you know, this is good. It's missing something. And then I tried it with, um, just crushed ice game changer. It totally changes the cocktail. Absolutely. Um, and it just, that small detail, um, brought everything together and just made it like an, all right, drink to like, holy cow, this thing is delicious. Um, and it was just through experimenting with different types of ice and that particular cocktail. Um, so I agree with you. I think ice is probably one of the, well, I think everybody knows how important uh, ice in general is with cocktails, but I think even more specifically types of ice can be really, really big influences, um, with, uh, with drinks as well. So when I'm, uh, when I'm trying to, you know, make a proper Mai Tai at home, if I, if I can, I, I go pick up a bag of crushed ice from like Sonic Burger or something like that. Um, they do sell bags of ice at their, at their drive through and drive up windows. So it's a little pro tip. If you know you're going to be around a Sonic and want to make cocktails later, bring a cooler and grab a bag of ice. Man, they are killing it with their ice. I swear to you. Uh, Sonic has been like Sonic ice has been a thing for, the, for a long time. It's so crazy. It's awesome. I want to give a shout out too. I'm actually, as we're talking here, I'm enjoying a, a zombie from uh, our local tiki bar here, the Cone Tiki in Oakland. Oh, nice. And um, I, I, I bought one of their zombies yesterday and brought it home. And they were kind enough to sell me a couple of delis of, of their crushed ice as well. Um, actually, I shouldn't say sell me. They, they gave them to me. And, yeah. uh, you know, what a difference, you know, it definitely elevated the cocktail experience here right now. So nice. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you. It's the ice is such a critical part of this. Um, and I, I'm really glad you, you kind of touched on that um, because ice, uh, especially for Tiki, it seems like it, it is much more pronounced, uh, the different styles of ice um, that you have and that are really necessary for, for making the right drink on that. Um, now, uh, are there any other tools that you guys use? Um, though I actually, the Hamilton Beach Spindle Blender, is that the one that looks like a milkshake machine? Exactly. It okay, is a milkshake cool. machine. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And what you'll find, too, if you if you do have one of these, um, it's great for, for speeding things up like like a dry shake. Mm-hmm. So if you have an egg white cocktail, you can, um, you can spin it in the Hamilton Beach with no ice, and that's going to emulsify all of your ingredients together and get that foam going for you. So then you can shake it with cubes 
and and it reduces the the uh, labor you have to put into like a egg white cocktail. Nice. Well, that's so that's just a little. Right there. That's a little side side use for your Hamilton Beach. I love it. <laughs> no more dry shaking. Uh, that's that's a, right. That's enough reason to buy one right there. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get sudden, covered in egg white anymore. All of a sudden, you're serving nothing but egg white drinks, and you're not mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Uh, no, I, I think we're gonna have to buy one for the house now because uh, yeah, that's, that just makes sense. <laughs> You won't regret it. I promise you. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen them pop in. Uh, I've seen them pop up in a couple of bars that I've been to, and I'm like, all right, I can see that because it started. I didn't notice it until after I left bartending, and then I started seeing them. I'm like, okay, this is there's something that, with that. I'm not sure what how it's being applied in cocktails, but I think um, now it makes a, a ton of sense. Yeah, everything from a from a zombie to a egg white sour or a Ramos fizz to a to a milkshake. I mean, shit, why not have a boozy milkshake? Yeah, true, absolutely. Um, so I gotta ask, what is the craziest cocktail you ever came up with? Um, it could be on a menu or it could not be. <laughs> the craziest? Yeah. Let's see here. I mean. I would say that uh, we have a cocktail called the Sparkle and Froth that is, you know, it, it, it checks all the boxes for like, um, you know, your, your ultimate like tiki cocktail or, or tropical cocktail. Um, you know, it's, it's nearly four ounces of rum, so similar to a rum barrel. Um, it's, it's got fresh pineapple juice, lime juice, uh, three different, uh, you know, syrup slash sweeteners. Uh, uh, and then, um, one dash of absinthe, which really is what like kind of transforms the whole thing. So similar to, um, like a zombie or, or like I said, a rum barrel, but something, something magic happens with that one dash of absinthe at the end of this, like, you know, rather complicated and involved build. And so that cocktail, we, uh, actually originally featured it, uh, at Pagan Idol and it was a big hit. And then, um, we were transitioning it off the menu uh, as I was leaving to open up Zombie Village, so I decided to throw it on the menu at Zombie Village and see what happens. Uh -huh. And it was even more popular somehow. And Zombie Village has a much deeper, bigger menu. But somehow that cocktail, you know, and it, it probably has something to do with the fact that it's one of the strongest drinks on the menu. That tends to always get a lot of attention. But um, I would say just in terms of the amount of ingredients and what the flavor profile ends up being when you're all said and done, uh, the sparkle and froth, definitely. Nice. Very cool. Excellent. Um, well, uh, one last question for you um, is, as you kind of see Tiki kind of evolve and kind of take this new new uh, new shape, um, is there any other trends that you're seeing that um, you're really excited about? Um, I would say I, I really love to see the use of, of uh, alternate spirits. We feature a lot of agave spirits. That's kind of something that I'm super passionate about uh, as well as rum. Uh, but I love seeing, you know, different spirits being introduced. I think that's um, a great, a great way to kind of like branch out from, from what we know as, cl you know, classic traditional tiki. Mm -hmm. But um and yeah, the, the use of sherries and amaros really interests me. Um, it's not easy to to balance a tropical cocktail with with just any amaro. So um, you know, I've experimented with that here and there. And and when I see that done really well, I I get very excited. But um, and then also fat washes is something that I see that you know trending here and there. You see people doing like coconut fat washing, and you know even something like a like a pork fat wash or something like that. Um, or a butter, you know, a rum butter wash is, is really cool. Um, and you know, anytime you see those types of techniques getting implemented and, uh, you know, done in a tasteful way, it's, it's, it's exciting to see what the results can be. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so are there any other, um, anything you want to promote, anything you're working on, um, that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been keeping busy with uh, I've been doing some virtual happy hours uh, via Zoom. Uh, most of these events have been uh, private for companies that want to 
host, um, you know, just a little social hour for their, for their employees who are at home sheltering in place. Uh, but it's been really cool. And, uh, we've got it worked out to where, uh, you know, we can send out like my tie kits, for instance, um, from our cask stores here, uh, in San Francisco, future bars has a couple of, uh, bottle shops in town and we're actually able to ship out like, you know, kits. So people have all the ingredients they need for these happy hours. Um, and it's been really cool. Uh, definitely a way for me to keep busy, uh, while the bars shut down and to connect with folks as well. Cause that's, you know, a big void for all of us is, you know, while we're sheltered in place, uh, you know, you're not getting that social interaction, but so that's been really good. Um, I do hope to launch a couple of uh, public ones and you can find me on Instagram at doc underscore parks. So I'll be promoting anything that, go, that, you know, will be public on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can also search me on Facebook, uh, search doc parks and you'll be able to find me. But um, I'd also like to plug our uh, zombie village Instagram. It's uh, at the zombie village. Uh, on there, you can find a link for our GoFundMe, which is a, uh, a fund where we've been uh, working on to help support our team while we're all out of work. Um, we've had a lot of really generous guests on there. Um, it's been wonderful, but always good to promote that. And then, uh, you know, g- give a follow to the Zombie Village, too, because we do have uh, a couple of uh, cool releases coming out. You know, and normally uh, with something like a mug release, we would do that at the bar exclusively. Mm -hmm. But given the uncertainty of when we're going to reopen, we might be doing an announcement for our Tiki Diablo mug release, which is coming up. And we also have a really cool pendant that Crazy Al Evans did for us. Um, And those are coming soon. We're very excited. It's a replica of the carving that he did inside of our bar. So if you're familiar with the um, giant tiki's we have at Zombie Village, uh, it'll be a replica of the carving that he did. So nice, pretty excited about those things. Perfect, excellent. Uh, well, we'll definitely include links to all those things in the show notes. Um, but like I said, man, I cannot thank you enough for your time uh, and sharing your kind of your knowledge about uh, modern style of tiki drinks and how you how you um, kind of got here. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. So thanks again for Daniel Doc Parks for sharing his uh, time and his knowledge about modern tiki with us. We'll have links to all the things we talked about in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 179. Uh, So we'll have some more episodes for you in the future. But until then, we hope that you're staying safe, enjoying some great cocktails, and we can't wait to have drinks with everyone. So cheers, everyone.